Welcome to the Hanu Health Podcast, where our mission is to help you to breathe better and stress less. On this show, we discuss a variety of topics and provide practical suggestions for improving health and well-being. However, none of the education, tips, and tricks provided should be taken as medical advice. Your medical doctor is your best bet if you have medical questions. Also, on this podcast, we interview numerous guests from diverse backgrounds, interests, and may carry some unique ideas. Hanu Health as a company does not endorse all statements provided by guests or condone all suggestions or protocols discussed. We just like hearing about cool people doing rad and new things. So sit back, relax, breathe, and enjoy the show. Steve, what's going on, man? Welcome to the Hanu Health Podcast. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man, dude, I was so excited. You know, I've known you for a little while now. Uh, we kind of go back and uh, for for a little bit of time now, and I knew kind of when we were putting it together, compiling the guests for the podcast, I was like, oh man, when it comes to like all things functional medicine, getting at the root cause, like I I know my dude. So, dude, one thing that I was uh, one thing that I was really curious about that I wanted to just pitch to you right away. Is like, dude, is there anything kind of like in this ever evolving like cycle and growth of the field of functional medicine that like you're super excited about right now? Anything like come to mind that's new and novel that I, maybe we haven't heard about? So a few things that uh, I'm excited about because you know that I love lab testing. So what I do is I essentially blend uh, ancient wisdom of Ayurvedic medicine and traditional Chinese medicine, uh, German biological medicine from like the early 1900s. Cause I love to read about all of that. And there's so much truth and wisdom in it. And then what we, cause it's about bioindividuality of each person, right? So we know that we're unique in our own way. Our symptoms seem to manifest based on our genetics and then also what's our genotype and then our phenotype, which is which, how we interact with our environment, right? Cause you have two identical twins. One could be a hundred pounds overweight, one at a normal weight. And it's like, okay, well that's how we interact with the environment. But what I do is I try to blend that with state of the art at home lab tests. Mm -hmm. And these at home lab tests are becoming so advanced that we are now starting to be able to look at even things like, uh, BDNF brain derived neurotrophic factor. Yeah. And you're, we're starting to measure these things right at home. So sky's the limit. I mean, I think 10 years from now, maybe 15 maximum, uh, it really will be in real time. Right now, you still have to send all of these things to a lab. Right. But, I mean, that's a small price to pay. Yeah, uh, but yeah. I think eventually, I, we're, I mean, really, we're looking within the next one to two decades being able to test all of this right at home. So it's, it's pretty fantastic. Yeah, that's, that's just an incredible thought. Because for me, it's kind of like when the, within the past decade, like just being able to test all of these crazy things that are highly important to our overall health and wellness, you know, even sending it off. I'm like, oh, man, that's cool. I get to hear back in a few weeks. But like the idea of like testing, let's say, you know, brain derived neurotrophic factor or BDMF in real time, like is just bizarre because we can get, you know, uh, solutions to problems just that much more quickly, which again, kind of like we're playing a bit of a race against the clock, right? I mean, we only have kind of a finite number of breaths left in us until kind of, you know, you know, the, our existence, you know, you know, it ceases to be, which is like a dark way to start this podcast, by the way, <laughs> but that's just how it is. Unless, you know, we are, you know, like Ben Greenfield or Dave Asprey, these crazy biohackers who, you know, say they're going to live till, to 180, which I don't think ben, ben Greenfield does that, but I know Dave, Dave wants to do that. Uh, maybe, maybe that happens, but even still a right. finite amount of time, which is just crazy to me to think that we can just like on the spot, like what are, what are for you? Like, they're like the low hanging fruit. Like if you could test something like every Every single day? Like, is there anything out there that like, maybe you have to send off that you're like, you know, if I could test this every day, I probably would. Yeah, that's a great question. So two things, uh, nobody's living to 180 within you and I's lifetime. Yeah, that's yeah. just not going to happen. Agreed. Uh, so I want to take that off the table. It's a nice <laughs> right. thought. But then I, and I say that because I want people to be able to trust what I am saying. And I just don't think that that's going to happen. I've seen nothing that's going to get us there because it would have to be dramatic because essentially we were a, a battle against entropy and cellular breakdown, mitochondrial breakdown, oxidative stress. Mm -hmm. So we know we need uh, a better antioxidant based capacity, but adding more antioxidants doesn't seem to help yet. It has to be endogenously produced. So we're going to figure it out. No, there's no doubt about it. However, the good news is this. Average life expectancy actually went down by about a year, which is not very good for the next yeah, generation. Yeah. So between like 74, it used to be 75 for men, 77 for women. 
It used to be 78. Other parts of the world, you can get another two, three years. You might get to 81 if, if you're, you know, part of like the, um, like Okinawans. Blue and zones, yeah. Exactly. More the blue zones. But again, even the blue zones are being diluted because of this Western based mentality. Like I did a few of my doctoral internships in China uh, and, and I saw the first generation actually becoming much more overweight, inflamed, playing video games. Like it just it just changed. Like they weren't biking. They weren't walking around like like the parents would be. But here's the good news is that it, there's 75 percent chance like all mortality comes down to high blood pressure. Technically, first, let's say cardiovascular disease, Mm -hmm. high blood pressure and stroke, cancer, and type 2 diabetes. Okay. Well, we have four things. Well, let's talk about three. Cardiovascular disease, very easy to catch and easy enough to prevent. High blood pressure, easy enough to catch if you're you're testing for it, right? Right. And easy to prevent or reverse, either one of those. And then type 2 diabetes, certainly easy enough to prevent, easy enough to reverse. Now, the wild card is cancer because we live in a world that's a toxic soup, right? It used to be, I wrote my book three years ago, 77,000 man-made chemicals. Now it's 140 plus man-made chemicals, 140,000. So it's pretty, it's pretty intense. Yeah. And every single year, you know, we make more plastics, flame retardants, different types of pesticides, et cetera. So that's kind of the wild card is cancer, but we can still do our best with a lot of what we know. Now, the reason why I mentioned this is because it is good news. Most of us, if we don't die from one of those four things, most of us will live until our late 80s. Mm. So that means we'll live until 88, 90 years old, 10 more years than our typical life expectancy. And then if you're doing other healthy things, you, you can probably push it to 100. So I think in our lifetime, 100 is very realistic. So I just wanted to share that with people. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. You know, the, the you know, main contributors that we know of, um, of, of basically all cause mortality right now, like while they may not have, let's say, uh, may not be mediated or kind of the root cause is stress. It's so interesting to me kind of how I throw stress in the mix there. And, you know, we, we have to look at kind of the toxic lifestyles that we all live or at least we're all exposed to. Right. And so there are environmental toxins, but the other, the more endogenous toxin is kind of our stress load that we have on us right now. And so I always kind of paint that picture in my mind. And again, I'm, I'm kind of built that way. You know, when you're a hammer, everything you see is a nail. So as a psychologist, I'm going to see kind of everything kind of having this underpinning um, kind of level of stress load being like impactful to all these things. So it's kind of, you know, interesting to me, um, again, that uh, some of the low hanging fruit um, is that, you know, number one, like if we have the ability to test to see what are kind of the, the, the root causes of potential um, deleterious effects of, you know, life in general, like it's, it's really good to be able to do that, but also too, kind of how much does stress play into that? Like, what's your take on that? Like, you know, again, like we, we can measure stress in certain ways, let's say heart rate variability, looking overall 24 hour cortisol cycles, but like, is, do you think that's a, a, a missing factor that most people are either overlooking or at least we acknowledge like on paper, but then in real life, we don't really necessarily do anything about yeah, so that and that's a great question, and I apologize, I kind of went off on a tangent there no, to, good, to you know pu- pull life expectancy in. But um, so the thing is, I love lab testing, and I'm I'm always doing new things for myself, and I recommend quarterly lab testing, and then for something we call the Big Five, I recommend doing that every six months to a year to know your numbers, see where you're trending, because if you know where you're trending, then you can fix things before they get off track, or if you're doing something really well, you say, okay, let's do more of this, you know, both count. So on a daily basis, I don't know that I would necessarily be lab testing, uh, except I would be looking at, at vitamins and minerals until I got things right. Meaning like Mm -hmm. once you, most people have this, they believe they have this wildly varied diet, but for the most part, we eat the same things pretty much every single day, right? It's just a little bit of change here and there. So if you get on point for your vitamin and mineral levels for your body, well, then you give your body the raw material it needs to then be able to fight against stress as well. So we Mm -hmm. know that we need a certain level of methylated B vitamins in order to be able to fight stress. The main one that people, like everybody loves talking about B12 mm-hmm. or, or folate. They love mm-hmm. that, right? Yeah. But it's B6, mm-hmm. right? Vitamin B6, and especially in paradoxal 5-phosphate form, there's different, there's different forms, but P5P, it actually helps as, a, as a, almost like an enzyme 
to allow you to produce more serotonin. So 5-hydroxytryptophan needs B6, it needs selenium, it needs a few other things like zinc to right. actually become serotonin. So B6 is actually built for the nervous system. It's one of the things that my mentor taught me because stress was such a big part of my issue. So when you go back to does stress, is, is stress an underlying root cause? Well, they say basically, Stress is implicated in 90% of all disease. And they also say that inflammation is implicated in 90% of all disease. The only reason they don't say 100% is because they need to give themselves a leeway because there might be something. <laughs> Got to have some wiggle room there. <laughs> right. Exactly. But, you know, stress causes inflammation, right? And inflammation yeah. also causes stress. So we have this cyclical movement in the body that once you get into a stress, chronic stress pattern, not like a stress, not a workout or a sauna session or a whatever, um, it starts to create inflammation. And then that inflammation just compounds stress because you're creating more free radicals in the body. And now your body needs what? Well, it needs a greater antioxidant-based capacity. Uh, you need to do things in order to squelch that stress. So for me, I'm looking at bio, I'm, I'm looking at your HRV, I'm looking at your sleep quality, deep sleep. You might have different preferences, but I need 90, I need 90 minutes of deep and I need two plus hours of REM in order for the brain to be able to cycle through inflammation, not inflammation, but information in that mm -hmm. REM part, you know, basically right. the storage units. And I needed to then um, move in and out of normal cycles. So I actually like people to wake up within a range of 30 minutes, not an alarm clock. So mm -hmm. we use wake mm -hmm. lights in my practice. We use things to naturally allow themselves to wake out of that sleep cycle so they wake with more energy too. So I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking at breath rate overnight. I'm looking at body temperature as well. So mm -hmm. I'm looking at recovery on a daily basis because everybody's so unique in that way. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I think there's so many aspects there that I really want to hit on, but you know, sleep is just a, it's gotta be a core component. Like if it's not the place where most people start, they really should, because I like, I've seen so many people, especially in the biohacking community that want to like biohack everything. Uh, but then kind of, they don't pay attention to kind of really the core components of sleep. And they're still just kind of getting really crappy sleep. And I'm like, you're really never going to to heal like if you do not get that component correct so I, I would love to jump back there here in just a minute but the one thing that you mentioned that I want to highlight too that I, I also brings me a little bit of frustration is that there are so many people who like will hear podcasts or they'll read about kind of like how to best manage stress and anxiety especially from kind of like a biochemical perspective and they'll end up like going out and just buying like literally every supplement that they can off the shelf in order to uh, basically uh, uh, you know, kind of like help out with what they perceive as a deficiency, but they're not testing it. Right. So they're just going out and buying like these huge bottles of, you know, B12 and B9 and B6 and, you know, 5 HTP. And they'll come to me and they're like, oh, uh, but I still like, don't feel great. And um, they, they actually sometimes will say, I feel worse. I feel like, like my energy is like all over the place. And it's just a really interesting thing that I, I, I want to like to discuss with you because like people get caught up in this idea that they, they believe that just because they're experiencing a symptom, so I feel stressed or I feel anxious or I feel depressed, must, must mean that I'm deficient in all of these other vitamins without getting tested for them. Like what's the pitfall to that? Like why do you think it is that people really turn more to that avenue and what should they do instead of just buying every supplement, you know, for quote unquote mental health or stress? Or anxiety, you know, on the market. Like, what, what would you do instead? Yeah, we we see a lot of this, and it's not that. I mean, I never say that I'm in the biohacking space because mm -hmm. I don't yeah. like where the space is going. Yep. You're really doing what a lot of medical doctors who call themselves functional medicine doctors do, uh, which is green medicine. So yeah. if someone comes in with high cholesterol, you're giving them niacin. And if you're someone comes in with low testosterone or whatever, you're giving them uh, testosterone replacement therapy rather than looking at and asking, why does this person have test low testosterone? So we're always asking why and we're looking for the underlying root causes, which are deficiencies and toxicities. So I know that's overly basic, but basically your body is too much of something that shouldn't be there, whether it is phthalates, triclosan, again, flame retardants, plastics, anything that your body's storing and it stores it typically in adipose tissue. So it's storing it in your fat, which is causing more inflammation, higher levels of estrogen, or it's storing it in your brain. And we certainly don't want it in your brain either because we know the detrimental effects of metals in the brain and oxidation and Alzheimer's dementia, et cetera. So what we do is we say, why does this person have 
brain fog, fatigue, low libido, et cetera. And then we look at the full spectrum of the person and we work on something that I call the de-stress protocol. So it's diet, exercise, stress reduction, toxin removal, rest, which are the sleep protocols, emotional balance, uh, scientifically based supplements and a success mindset. And the reason why three of those stress, emotional balance and success mindset are in there is we, because we found these are the protocols. I mean, I've been doing this now, worked with over a quarter million people. We know what works and we've just, cause we've done it so much. And so you know, it works and we lab test. So we make sure that people are getting better and we can see their after results. However, some people relapse. Why do some people relapse? And again, I'm always honest. Mm -hmm. It's because they have deep trauma from childhood, previous relationships, anything that goes back to stress and the peripheral nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. That means their brain is, so their psychology is actually affecting their physiology. So they re-give themselves SIBO through ileocecal valve dysfunction because their stress goes to their gut, right? Some people's stress goes to their neck, some people their stomach, some people their gut, and it's kind of where they hold it. And so all of a sudden now, okay, they have SIBO again. They've got gut issues again because it affects the enteric nervous system, which is in the gut. So what we do is we say we use everything. It's an integrative health practice-based approach. And the problem with biohacking is like, oh, I ran this or I think I have low dopamine. So I'm just going to start taking herbs and vitamins that boost right. dopamine or mm -hmm. I have low serotonin. So I'm going to take tryptophan or I'm going to take 5-HTP and we're just going to see what happens. What people don't realize is that you can't put one thing in your body without another effect happening. Mm -hmm. And every single thing you put in your body breaks down into a metabolite. So if you go overboard with dopamine, that's an excitatory neurotransmitter. That means your body needs to try to produce more GABA or more 5-HTP or something calming so that you don't burn out your nervous system or end up with too much downhill metabolite like DOPAC, VMA. And these things are pretty toxic to the liver and the bloodstream. So um, I just urge people to look deeper as to why maybe you have low dopamine and then to work on the lifestyle as well as supplementation. But supplementation is just one part of it. Yeah, that's, I mean, those are great points. There's one guy that I follow that I, I found completely fascinating. His name's Dr. William Wallace. I don't know if you've heard of him, uh, which is funny because he's no. the brave, brave heart guy. Um, but Dr. William Wallace, he does a lot of research. I mean, he's a PhD. I want to say he's a biochemist. Uh, and his research looks at kind of like when we intake kind of these ex ex exogenous supplements for mental health, like what do they do in the depletion of other areas? So can we uh, intake something like 5-HT as a supplement and and then deplete, let's say, like dopamine levels or deplete other areas. So we, we have to remember that sometimes these supplementations, if not all the time, can come with side effects, just like, you know, you know, allopathic type of medication. There are these side effects. And it's not to say that, you know, that means that we can never take anything like 5-HTP or we can never take anything, you know, like, you know, supplemental B12 or B9 or B6. Like, it, it might make sense in circumstances. But we also have to remember that we need to figure out, like, exactly what is the root cause of what's going on going on because to your point and again this is one thing that for me as a psychologist that I really hone in on is that it may not be that there's an inherent kind of like um, uh, depletion of B6 or B12 that's at the root cause of why someone's experiencing depression it could be kind of one of the main contributors but it also may it may be that someone has experienced kind of a lifetime of psychological stress because of relationships or because of trauma that is then manifesting in a slew of physiological ailment. So like, I, I think that it's just, uh, to, you know, again, to your point that we have to make sure that we leave no stone unturned and not just say that, oh, well, I heard that the biohackers are testing for this, or I heard that, you know, the a depletion of this will equate to, you know, me taking something to then cover it and then I'll feel better. Like, it's just not the case. Like a, a lot of people could end up wasting a lot of their time, a lot of their money and potentially cause detriment in other areas. Is, like depleting of other neuromodulators and neurotransmitters. And so you really need to work with someone like you, Stephen, who knows what they're doing um, so that you can give a full assessment of like, hey, like this is maybe kind of the areas we need to focus on and work on. Because in the end, like I have a lot of people who I've seen in the past who will go and, you know, uh, you know, just kind of not necessarily I will say mess up their system, but they'll kind of just flippantly do things because they've heard about it. And then we come to they come to me and I look and kind of assess kind of again from a psychological perspective. And I'm like, Oh, goodness, well, it looks like you haven't addressed, you know, the trauma, you haven't addressed, you know, the actual underlying work stress that you're experiencing. 
and then we get kind of going down, you know, a, a parallel path with the other things so that, you know, that we're that we're working on. So no, I, I I really appreciate that. So if you're dealing, let's say let's say you're dealing with someone who is having just like a really significant stress load, you've kind of like looked at again kind of a, a, a slew of lab testing, and you find out you know whatever you find out. Let's say you know you find out that they are deficient in you know some areas, and let's say also too they're having some psychological stress due to you know relationships or trauma. Like for you, kind of what is your go-to like what it what for you what does the roadmap typically look like in helping this individual yeah so i mean i can just every monday and thursday i meet with our uh, equal life health coaching team and we we run tens of thousands of labs every single year people all over the world and they bring me the hardest cases and because mm-hmm. we've, we've gone yeah. over so many thousands of cases that we have all these protocols for for individuals and and they're an amazing team so i help out with you know, the hardest, the hard cases. So we had this, um, one, one guy come in, uh, later thirties and a little bit underweight. So, cause you kind of want to know about the person's uh, physiology as well, because if someone's underweight, you can say, okay, this is my person might be in more of a catabolic based state. So we know that that's already a stress based state on the body. So we, we start to think about that sympathetic nervous system, st- uh, stress, et cetera. But then they ran the big five labs, the big five labs. I won't get too much into them, but basically we're looking at gut function, food sensitivities, uh, electrolyte, mineral levels, vitamin levels, and we're looking at omega-3 versus omega-6 for inflammation. So this person, though, also ran a neurotransmitter test. And again, these tests can all be done at home. Now, if we were to just to look at the neurotransmitter test, we would see low inhibitory neurotransmitters like serotonin and GABA that are calming, but we also saw all low excitatory neurotransmitters like norepinephrine, uh, glutamate, dopamine, et cetera. So we're like, wow, this person's low across the board. The mm-hmm. only way that you really get low neurotransmitters across the board is chronic stress from a deep emotional based event in your life. And that wipes you out. And I was I was there myself at 17 years old. So my story kind of going back a little bit. I got really sick at 17 years old. Part of it was pharma, pharmacologically induced, taking antibiotics for three years straight for acne. Uh, that'll destroy your gut function, which will destroy your immune system, which will imbalance what's called TH1, TH2 immunity. My body just shut down. It took me a long time to recover, but luckily I did. And so I'm here to talk about it. Um, okay. But, you know, with this individual, if we were just to look at neurotransmitters, we'd say, okay, let's help this person produce more 5-HTP, GABA, uh, norepinephrine, and dopamine, and they'll be feeling so much better. The problem with that is this. Luckily, we ran their hormones as well. They had low cortisol all throughout the day and then high cortisol in the evening. Mm -hmm. So this person has what's called the dysfunctional diurnal rhythm. They feel like a zombie, like literally the walking dead when they wake up. They have brain fog, low mood, irritability, overwhelm. And then at night they have plenty of energy and they can't sleep. And so they think they're a night owl. A recipe for disaster. It is a recipe for disaster, exactly, because now, okay, we should have our inhibitory neurotransmitters going at night and our excitatory neurotransmitters more in the morning. Cortisol should be elevated in the morning. Thyroid should be elevated in this morning. And in this person's thyroid, even though they're underweight, was actually underperforming. And they had a little bit of what's called estrogen dominance with lower testosterone. So their testosterone is converting more to estrogen, which obviously most men don't want. It's going to cause more body fat, gynecomastia, potentially acne, et cetera. So what we did was we really looked at things from a holistic standpoint. This person's stressed. So now they're not even absorbing. Their minerals were low. Their vitamins were low. And they were low because when you're stressed, it affects your digestion. So now you can be putting the best foods in the world in your body, but you're not absorbing them to the greatest capacity because you have less stomach acid typically. Sometimes you have acid reflux, but you have less stomach acid. You have less enzymes being produced. And the food stays in your gut longer, which means that it could possibly ferment and and create more gas and and bacterial overgrowth. So we took a holistic standpoint, understanding that 12 to 16 weeks is what most people need to begin to make that change in their body. We looked at naturally calming uh, the HPA axis, the adrenals at night, because you do have to use supplementation in the beginning. And the reason is that you're, you're stuck in this vortex yeah. and you need to get enough traction to get out of it. And the only way that you can do that is to just say, okay, I'm literally going to move to a ashram and meditate 
all day and get calm and relax so that I can bring back my digestion so that I can then improve my mineral and vitamin. You know, it's like you have to do something to give yourself what, what was told me is a heroic push, right? So it's easier to give the heroic push with the right vitamins and minerals. In this case, ashwagandha, L-theanine, phospholocerine, a product we call Adrenal Soothe, mm -hmm. with magnesium, with a little bit of liquid melatonin so it's non-groggy so we can get them sleeping. Because like you said, you need to be able to sleep. And you need to be able to sleep at the right times, a few hours after the sun sets to basically when the sun rises. That's when humans were meant to sleep. All these biohackers saying that there's, oh, you can go to bed at any time because there's different rhythms. No, there's not. There's one human natural diurnal rhythm. And lowest cortisol shown by scientific testing is 9.30 p.m. at night. Get to bed by 10 p.m., wake up eight, seven, somewhere between seven and nine hours later for the individual. Mm -hmm. So we start there. We start with digestion and um, no doubt that this person is going to see an improvement all across the board. Yeah, no, that's, that's incredible. It just shows kind of the importance of how do, taking a deep dive, uh, which you do not see in allopathic medicine, unfortunately, there's just no time in managed care. I mean, you got 15 minutes with a person, if that. I mean, my God, if that. And so you can't take this deep dive into doing kind of this intricate lab testing as well as getting their story, like getting their background, because really that's how you piece the puzzle together. And it's just interesting for the uh, you know example that you that you just shared, like just all of the pieces start to come together when you really start to take a deep dive into their labs, you take a deep dive into their behavioral patterns and then just their history like from from their anecdote and i and i just think that's in, an incredible way like that's got to be the way the healthcare goes unfortunately like you know we see that kind of like the the times you know that people are spending with their healthcare provider especially during the time of covid the window doesn't appear like it's getting much broader it actually appears like it's even shrinking more and more just because people are getting out the out out the door like as fast as we can just the managed care systems awful and so it's good to hear that you know especially for you, you guys are taking a very integrative, holistic, and I really stress that word holistic perspective that's looking at all the different potential avenues. One thing that you mentioned that is always a question that is asked, um, and I'd love to take a little bit more of a deep dive into there, is like, what is the relationship between gut health, what's going on in the gut, and then overall mental health, overall, uh, you know, stress experience, anxiety experience, because that is another area too, that I tell people, like, if you're not focusing on that area, you can be doing all of the right things, like you mentioned, like you could be eating all of the great things that we're quote unquote, supposed to be eating. But if gut health is not there, and there's something dysfunctional going on there, you still may not be doing you still may be doing yourself a huge disservice so can you speak to the role of gut health and mental health a hundred percent and just in going back to that client too which I, I forgot to mention is that i said when, when you see these depleted mineral levels because minerals are essentially electricity for the body we always like to give the credit to vitamins but i would say it's minerals actually that have a much greater role in the body than than vitamins i mean vitamins right. are obviously important but it's minerals literally that give us the electric charge in the body so this person went through a, a bad divorce three years ago, and the recovery still wasn't there. So a lot of men, uh, they, they don't seek out uh, counselors and therapists. So that was actually part of our advice. We said, listen, we're not providing medical advice to you, um, but it, it typically – uh, you'll see a lot of benefit by getting to speak with someone, a, yeah. a someone that you believe that you just even just get these things off your chest and start to talk about it and they get another human's input. So that was actually one of the recommendations because, again, we're trying to look at the whole picture. Yeah. And, and not to stop you real quick, but one thing that I, I always tell you know my audience, especially men, is that because men um, tend to be cognitive first and then body second. In other words, like they may experience it kind of cognitively, but they don't want to. So they don't verbalize it to others. They manifest it so much more a lot of the times than women do, because women a lot of times want to verbalize it. They want to get it out there. They may not always do it. So then it can manifest physiologically. But for men, it's just notorious, like kind of, you know, again, the gut problems, you know, holding tension in the shoulders, getting those migraine or tension type headaches. So I just kind of wanted to point that out to the audience again, if they haven't heard me say that is that for men, like uh, one of the telltale signs for me, a lot of the times that they're experiencing significant stress or mental load is when they experience kind of a lot of these physiological symptoms as well, it just manifests that way. So just wanted to you know touch on that real quick, but yeah, you go for it. hundred percent. Yeah. Brain fog, low mood, irritability, overwhelm, low testosterone, low libido. Th these are, these are things that we see 
uh, all the time that are not normal, but they're common, and that's due to chronic stress. It could be lack of sleep, it could be stress in life, et cetera, but it, you know, these do happen. But what happens is stress affects the guts uh, because what happens is your, your nervous system does one of two things. It's in the sympathetic nervous system or it's in the parasympathetic nervous system. So that's the autonomic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is fight or flight. So it's bringing blood, let's say, to the arms and legs rather than your stomach. Mm -hmm. But when you're in the peripheral nervous system, okay, the blood's going to be moving more towards the core and the digestive system to break down food. So if you put food in your body while stressed, it's most likely going to stay in your stomach longer. It's going to ferment there, can cause gas. It's not going to go through the normal digestive process where um, HCL, hydrochloric acid, uh, as well as pepsin are breaking down those proteins, which are the hardest to break down. So what happens is then we get partially digested food moving into the duodenum, the first part of that, that uh, small intestine, where the majority of digestion is taking place. So now, all of a sudden, again, we get more gas, more bloating, um, and, and sometimes either constipation or loose stool based on where our body is trending. The problem with that is that then we're not really absorbing our nutrients, which helps to help our brain function because our brain does need the production of serotonin, which is predominantly happening in the gut. Uh, and it needs those B vitamins, especially again, B12 is good for the brain. So I'm not saying it's not B6 for the nervous system. They all help B1 for the thyroid and, and B5 uh, actually for the adrenals. So what we're looking at though is overall inflammation in the gut. Because when there's poor absorption, you inflammation because there's putrefaction in the gut. So there can be yeast overgrowth, bacterial overgrowth, we call that either candida overgrowth or SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, where the small intestine is supposed to be a little bit more sterile. Well, the problem with this is that the white blood cells and about 70, 80% of our immune system are basically hanging outside the gut, looking for anything to go inside and fight off or anything that leaks through the gut with leaky gut it fights off as well. Now, a lot of people say, well, this is a gut-based issue, but it's not. It creates systemic inflammation, and systemic mm -hmm. inflammation yeah. affects the entire nervous system as well as, so not just the enteric nervous system, which is your gut, but it affects the brain as well. So the brain is connected to the gut. The gut is connected to the brain through something called the vagus nerve, which runs right up through the neck behind the ear. And we all know that when we don't feel well to our gut, we don't feel well in our mind either, right? right. We feel kind of off. And so you already can feel the connection. Now, think about that just on a lower level, maybe 20, 30 percent of that on a daily basis. You're not going to be your best. It's going to run you down over time. So now you're in a predicament, though, because you need to work on your psychology, but you can't forget about your physiology because your physiology is now off. You have an imbalance in your gut. Right. It's either parasites, H. pylori, candida overgrowth or SIBO. And we see all of them in our practice. But the nice thing is it's really only four plus leaky gut. So we need to fix one of those four or two or three and at the same time work in the psychology. So too many practitioners are only working on the body and then, you know, some working on the mind. And they're both great. It's hard to do everything. We certainly are helping with the mind, but more so through exercise, sleep, uh, biofeedback, meditation, and then recommending experts like yourself for the psychology mm -hmm. part of it. Hey, Jay here. Hate to interrupt this show, but I have to tell you about our amazing sponsor for today's episode. Yeah, it's Hanu Health. That's H A N U Health, my company. And I've got good news and I've got bad news. So the bad news is, is that I'm going to have to be quite cryptic for a while as to what we're building. But what I can say is that it is in the space of health technology, and it's going to be revolutionary. Just think about this show. You have myself, who is an expert in heart rate variability, and Patrick, who is an expert in breath work, and he is one of our primary advisors. Hmm. And what's the good news? Well, even though you have no idea about what the company is offering as a product, we are offering an exclusive VIP waiting list so that you can be the first to know about it. Not only will you reserve your spot in line, you will also gain access to our informative newsletter. We will update you on where we are as a company and provide special incentives and promotions. All you need to do is go to hanuhealth.com slash waitlist. That is 
hanuhealth.com slash waitlist. I promise you will not want to miss out on what is to come. We are building the biohacker's dream, but it will be useful for every human being on this planet. I'm, I'm not even speaking in hyperbole. I'm serious. Every human could benefit from what we are making. So again, head on over to hanuhealth.com slash waitlist to get your spot now, and I will just, you know, leave you with bated breath. You know, I love it. I don't know if I've ever actually heard it framed the way you did, um, which was phenomenal. That when someone, which typically is a lot of people nowadays, when we have this chronically turned on sympathetic nervous system, which inhibits our vagus nerve from being extremely active and engaged, then one of the biggest problems that you're saying that we see is that obviously it is, it is sympathetic arousal is going to shut off digestion. There's no need. If you're getting chased by the mountain lion, you don't need digestion to work. You need oxygen-rich blood flow to go into areas of the body that is going to help you survive that threat. So you don't need digestion at that point. It's not that it's not advantageous from an evolutionary perspective. So again, what if the mountain lion is chasing you all day, every day, 24 seven, which may sound kind of extreme, but unfortunately the body from an evolutionary perspective doesn't understand that there is no mountain lion because these compounding stressors, whether they're finances or relationships, the body responds in almost a very similar way, maybe not to the extreme nature, but the compounding nature very much so. And what is that going to do? It's going to keep food, like you said, sitting in the gut to ferment, to cause all of this potential uh, deleterious effect in the gut, like things like H. pylori, candida, um, you know, dysbiosis, uh, which then is going to cause inflammation in the rest of the body. So it's this unfortunate negative, uh, or I would say this feedback system or loop system that causes systemic inflammation. So it's almost like, you know, stress begets, you know, you know, poor health, which begets more stress, which begets poor health. It's this unfortunate, vicious cycle. So I appreciate you highlighting out there, it just speaks to the importance of really making sure, yes, we address gut health, but also too, one of the things that could be at the root cause of gut, poor gut health is this kind of constant turned on sympathetic fight or flight, uh, fight or flight aspects of the nervous system that is then wreaking havoc on the rest of the body. So I just really appreciated that because I'm not sure if I've had it painted like that before and you did so in, a, in an elegant way. So no, that's, that's great, man. Yeah, no, happy, happy to. And, and that's why we also teach, though, there's not one program for everyone. I mean, if you're turned on all the time with the sympathetic nervous system, just like you said, because of stress in any area of your life, you have to understand that doing really hard boot camp workouts and cold plunges and all of these things, they're also stressors. So you yeah. might say, well, it's a hermetic stressor. It's a good stressor. It's not a good stressor if your body cannot recover from it. Right. right. And so and if you're if you take one of these lab tests and you see that your cortisol is higher at night when it shouldn't be, well, now you're not getting your deep sleep, which is typically within the first three to four hours of the night. So if you're not getting in a deep sleep, OK, now you're not getting the recovery. You might stay asleep, but you might not actually be recovering overnight. So what we say is we love high intensity interval training. We love sauna. We love cold plunge. We love all of these things. However, are you adding more stress to a rain barrel that's already overflowing of stress. Mm -hmm. And for a period of time, you might need more calming, more light sauna, infrared sauna. You might need more biofeedback, meditation, tai chi, qigong, going for walks, calming the body rather than ramping it up. And then when your body then recharges, recovers, now you go back into what I call a graduated exercise protocol where you get back into these things, allowing your body to adapt to stress and you'll actually be stronger because of it. And the only reason I know these things is I had Addison's disease. Mm -hmm. I had rheumatoid arthritis, POTS, mm -hmm. myalgic encephalitis, type 2 diabetes, and Addison's disease. And Addison's disease is when you stop producing cortisol. Mm -hmm. And it's a brutal way to live. Most people will never get there, which is good. It's fortunate. But you'll live with almost like a functional Addison's disease of low cortisol production after years of chronic stress. And that is when you're constantly inflamed. Because we think of cortisol as a bad thing, but believe it or not, cortisol is a natural anti-inflammatory, and it can actually be really helpful in recovery. Right, exactly. Uh, you just want to modulate that, right? And so yeah. when you have none, you're always inflamed, you always have brain fog, you always feel terrible, and, and um, I don't want that for anybody, of course. 
Yeah. You, again, this speaks to the biohackers pitfall, right? Which is like you try to throw kind of like everything under the sun at it um, as far as hormetic stressors goes. But the problem is, it's like, yeah, we don't want to villainize the sympathetic nervous system. It works for us in, in, in a beautiful way in so many areas, just like we don't want to villainize cortisol, just like we don't want to villainize, you know, uh, uh, cholesterol. Like there's all these things that we kind of throw into like the bad camp or these are the bad guys, but they're not, but they can work for us and they can work against us. And so if you're someone who is in this chronic state of sympathetic arousal and then you all you do is throw more sympathetic arousal at it things like you know engaging in hit training or engaging in you know sauna or engaging in cold plunges like they're not working as hormetic stressors they're just being chronic stressors for you uh, that that are just deleterious just like you know psychological stress could be and again the bo- the mind and the body they don't know the difference when they're experiencing it because for it it's just like oh here is a yet another stressor that I'm not recovering from and so it goes into kind of almost like shutdown mode. It's self-preservation mode because your body's going to do whatever it can up to a point to protect you from dying. And so, uh, you know, I, I like that because again, like I think so many people hear this information of like, oh, I need to do hit or I need to do a cold plunge or I need to go do sauna. And it's like those things can be very advantageous to your mental and physical well-being, but only if you have the ability to recover, if your nervous system can recover. And this is why and brings us to a great topic area. This is why I use HRV as a proxy because you need to know whether your nervous system is recovering or not. Because if you see that it takes a hit and it just stays down and it can't recover back to its baseline, or if the baseline just kind of starts off lower than maybe where it should be, then that again, that should be the signaling system. That should be the awareness system that, uh uh-oh, before we start any of this type of quote unquote hormesis or hermetic stressors that could benefit you down the road, like, we need to take a step back. That's not the first place we need to go. So let's talk about how you use HRV. Like, how do you use it as a proxy for nervous system functioning, for recovery? Like, what does that look like uh, for your clientele? Yeah, HRV needs to be one of the biometrics that everyone is tracking. So although I said no at-home lab testing on a daily basis, it's just not typically needed for most people. Right. Um, You know, it's just not something that we do. You can test your blood sugar on a daily basis. That's a great thing to do. Fasting glucose in the morning. Uh, it'd be like taking your body temperature in the morning, taking your HRV. All of those things are great. Those those are great at-home things. I've used a continuous glucose monitor for many months at a time to mm-hmm. test variables in my diet. And actually, I found out some interesting things. So for me, yeah. I found, um, just like most people, again, so here's the thing about biohacking and the stressors, right? So if you do, if you do a cold plunge or even cryo, you're going to feel amazing when you get out of it. And here's the reason. You just threw your norepinephrine, your adrenaline, and your dopamine through the roof. Now, you right. might say, well, I feel great when I do those things. Yes, you do, but at a cost. Because now you just depleted a greater amount of B vitamins, vitamin C, glutamine, all your stress, zinc. And over time, maybe not for three to six months, where you crash. The human body is very strong. It's very resilient. It, and that's why you can't run just your blood work. Because your blood work will always rob your bones for calcium. Yep. It will, I mean, it will just pull from wherever it needs to. So that's not a great metric. Now, also, and obviously you, you've chatted about this in your podcast since you are the expert in HRV. If you do these hit trainings or cold plunges, your HRV may actually go up for a period of time. That is not a sign that you're doing the right thing. That's a sign that, okay, your body is trying hard right now Let's see what happens if you take a day or two off. Does it crash? Or if you keep going, will it crash? Eventually, it will. So HRV is an early warning indicator. And that's why I'm a big advocate of looking at HRV, body temperature, breath rates, um, your deep sleep, your REM. All of that is very important to me. And for heart rate variability, what I'm looking for, and I even did this for myself, and I work with you as well on this, is to say, um, I mean, in real time, what is causing me? to have these drops in HRV. And for me, it was a drop in oxygen, which was really interesting for me to realize. I'm like, oh, this is is very interesting. I'm getting drops in oxygen overnight. I've got, broke my nose twice. I have a deviated septum, had my adenoids removed, my tonsils removed, there's scarring back there. Okay, let me try more mouth taping. Let me try, and what actually worked was um, the old school nasal strips to help open my nasal passages because of the deviated septum. Mm -hmm. Um, and then not an elevated bed, but just making sure my head was up a bit so I could, it's kind of like you're doing CPR, right? The the head chin tilt right there Uh to help get oxygen better in. And the other thing that I found really impressive was I love weight training. I really do. I've always loved it. Mm -hmm. It got me through really hard times in college when I was sick and in my early twenties, 
But aerobic based training, which I used to throw under the bus because I was a uh, certified personal trainer and strength and conditioning <laughs> coach in my early 20s. You lose all your muscle. Uh, and we, that's right. Forget about the cardio. We can transform your body without that. But what I'm realizing now is aerobic training for your lymphatic system, circulation, your heart rate variability, your deep sleep, your telomerase, that, that, which helps increase mm -hmm. telomere length, is invaluable. So I don't love cardio. I don't love going for a run or a bike. But I do it now because the literally within a week, it improves everything. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the shocking things to me, which, uh, again, working on you and daily HRV is what I saw. Right. You know, people that say they like cardio are just lying. They're, they don't all like cardio. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's really fascinating because, you know, uh, there's, so there's a couple of things that stood out here. So one thing that I always tell people is you need to do two different things when it comes to heart rate variability. Number one, you need to be measuring it. And then number two is that you need to be taking kind of that objective data that you get and then also marrying it with subjective data, right? So you need to also check in to see whether or not, like, do I feel primed? Do I feel okay? Or do I feel stressed? Because again, we know that there is a lot of input and influence into the biometric that is heart rate variability. Yes, it's a great proxy to the nervous system for recovery, for stress resiliency, but also too, um, there are other cardiac and respiratory influences um, that can you know, make that number go up or down. So we have to marry that with, you know, a level of subjectivity and objectivity. But then also too, like we, you know, when, when people wear CGMs, um, one of the things that I say too, and you know, the company levels is really big right now. We, I, I call it the levels effect is like when you put on a CGM, like you automatically, number one, are going to check it because you're curious. Like you want to be self-aware what influences that metric that is, you know, blood glucose and the HRV is the same way you put on a continuous HRV measurement and you're going to be interested as to saying, okay, well, what is it that kind of makes it go up, down, left, right? That's great, valuable information. But there's also another effect that I see as well is that when people tend to um, consistently measure their HRV, um, and if they do it continuously, like with a continuous monitor, then for them, their mind is also going to be thinking throughout the day, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, like I need to be aware of kind of my overall stress load. I need to be aware of my breathing patterns. It's almost like a bit gamified, right? I don't know if it's like this for you, uh, Stephen, for me, like if I've got a CGM on, like I'm ga it's gamification for me. Like I'm like, Oh man, let me see kind of what I can do to not make that glucose, you know, spike way up or get a bad, you know, metabolic score. Like I gamify it. I do the same thing with like heart rate variability because for me, yeah, like heart rate variability is a great data or biometric, but it's also like for me, like that is an, in is indicative of my stress load. And so if I can kind of keep that within the window that I want to keep it in, you know, reasonably. So like, I know, like if I go out and do, you know, some hardcore exercise and I'm trying to recover, like my scores are going to be lower, like depending on kind of the type of workload I did. But it's just a great, great way for not only for me to be self aware of it, but for me just to remember to self regulate, which is a key component here, um, that people like if they take away anything from my, you know, talks on heart rate variability, I always talk about self aware of kind of what affects you and then self aware of kind of what helps you to, to best self regulate. Have you found, like I know that you've done a lot of personalized, you know, training and, and work and heart rate variability for yourself and then also for clientele. Like, what have you seen as kind of being like the low hanging fruit? Like the things that you're like, these are my recommendations for many people. Like if you really want to work on heart rate variability, you mentioned, you know, exercise as being one of them. Anything else that you're like, these are another, other key components that I've really seen move the needle. For me, I look at this right, right now. So I love the continuous heart rate variability, but uh, there's not a lot of companies right now that are mm -hmm. able to give you that great feedback all day long. Because right. when I had that, and I got a little bit of that vibration, right, that haptic feedback, then immediately I was like, all right, what am I doing? Let's not repeat that. And let's do a little bit of biofeedback just for a minute or three yeah. minutes. Because yeah. I love being, it was a game, right? I love being able to see yes. my, my heart rate variability double. Yeah. That, that was the goal. And, and the same with the continuous glucose monitor. But then there's also what people have to understand is that um, you don't always necessarily want your blood sugar below a 90. Like there are right. times when you actually want it to go a little higher. Like, I'm not saying above 150, but what happens is we always, again, we get in the biohacking mode, not you, but the biohacking sphere has said, you need to maintain 75 uh, for your glucose all day long. And that's actually not beneficial. If you looked at leptin and ghrelin and you look at thyroid hormones and you look at cortisol, if you get a higher uh, measure in blood sugar, hormones start to change. 
And oh, the body is actually getting carbohydrates or it's getting these things that can calm cortisol, that can increase thyroid, that can increase um, leptin and decrease ghrelin. Like these are not bad things. So I just want to throw that right. out there. And the reason why I say that is it's also the same for heart rate variability. Yeah. I used to go for a run and my heart rate variability while I was wearing the continuous HRV would drop dramatically. Yep. However, that next day, my heart rate variability in that night would be even better. Yes. So it's it's the whole picture. It really is a holistic approach to looking at it. And for me, a couple things that have uh, definitely improvement is stop eating three to four hours before bed. Mm -hmm. I mean, that yeah. might just be the game changer for everything for HRV. Stop eating four hours before bed. Um, not only is it great for intermittent fasting, but for deep sleep and for uh, body temperature, because the reason is then your body's not using all this energy for digestion in the stomach. So that's a big one. Uh, sleep in a cool room. That's a mm. big one. Or take a shower yep. before bed uh, to get rid of, release some of that heat. And um, the aerobic based cardio, those are game changers. And then the biofeedback. You want to learn to really yes. be able to. It's like it's one of those things where then it, it has to kick into instinct. And I know you chatted about this with me before, too. You do the work. So that when you're not doing the work, you hopefully it sticks. And exactly. You start to breathe more like a normal human being <laughs> rather than hold your breath, breathe, <laughs> hold your breath, and, and yeah. you know that you're just breathing normally through your nasal passages as well. Yeah, it's it's so important. You know, we do biofeedback, yes, as kind of an acute way of increasing heart rate variability to reduce, you know, kind of the overall sympathetic load, increase parasympathetic flow and vagal tone, which is great. It helps us out like in the moment to really help to de-stress. But what's really cool is kind of the compounding effect that happens happens the more and more we practice that we don't have to be consciously aware of when we're engaging in this deep diaphragmatic breath work or engaging in biofeedback, the body automatically goes into it because it knows that this is something that is going to help me in the moment to get out of this stress response and can be quite effective. So yeah, absolutely. I think biofeedback acutely and transiently is really great to help people, but it's even better if you practice it consistently and really build up that level of resiliency um, to stress uh, through that type of practice. You know, the other thing that you really hit on that I, I, I'm really appreciative of is that, again, we demonize low heart rate variability. This goes back to kind of like the things that we demonize. Just like, you know, sometimes we demonize high blood pressure, right? And But sometimes high blood pressure can be extremely effective in these transient situations. So like, especially too, like when we see people, like a lot of people think that, you know, we just need to have kind of that perfect, you know, you know score, whether it's, you know, whatever, we'll say the, you know, 115 over 70 or 120 over 70. People think like, that's it. Like we need that and anything above that. Uh -uh, no, it's good. You're headed towards, you know, cardiovascular cardiovascular disease. And it's not the case. We have plenty of research that really proves that that's, that's not correct. Like those, those numbers are not like, let's say the ideal human numbers, just like the, you know, 75 is not the ideal, you know, glucose number for people. The same thing goes for heart rate variability. And we expect that heart rate variability is going to drop in certain situations. And we also expect too. a lot of people will say, like, they ask me, they're like, so I just got done, you know, with hardcore workout. I did, let's say a CrossFit workout, a Metcon. And my heart rate variability started at 50 and like dropped down to like in the single digits and or to like you know the low teens they're like immediately after the workout should i then like do breath work and i'm like there's not a ton of research that indicates that it's advantageous for you just to kind of raise that response you might actually again this comes back to the you know hormetic stressors if it works for that person if you're doing that cons for a lot of crossfitters doesn't really work they're like all getting injured and sick uh, but for those who maybe it does work for um, having that low HRV is indicative that you put yourself through a stressor and your body will naturally, as long as you're, you, you're not overtraining or overreaching or have some underlying condition, your body will recover. And a lot of times it will recover in a more resilient manner. Heart rate variability will increase that thermostat will go up. So your whole you know goal of trying to like increase it immediately may not actually, it may be a bit of a waste of your time. You don't need to necessarily do that. So I think you have to understand the context, right? And that's kind of what you're speaking to is kind of understanding the context, not demonizing it just because like you see it go low during certain circumstances. It may be the signal and awareness that you need to raise it up. Maybe you're kind of in a really high stress situation where you could use some biofeedback or you could use some other means to de-stress, but it doesn't ne necessarily mean that. So no, I, I appreciate that. I also like the, you know, the, the, the sleep strategies that you mentioned for raising heart rate variability, because that is just another incredibly important and low hanging fruit that if you do not address, which 
I think we should address that. Now, if you do not address it in its entirety, like again, I don't care kind of the, you know, immense amounts of biofeedback or the exercise endurance training that you're doing. Like if sleep is not there as a component that you've addressed, like the overall stress load that you're experiencing won't necessarily just go down because you're doing all of these other things. So I know you've kind of, we, we've dabbled in it, we've hit on it a couple of times, but let's talk a little bit about stress and I'm sorry, about sleep and unpack that kind of maybe in, in, in a little bit more depth. So what are kind of, again, the, the low hanging fruit for, for sleep? Like, are you using like for yourself and then other clientele, are you utilizing biometrics like wearables that look at sleep architecture to kind of drive or influence like where you take them from a, from a protocol perspective? Like let's, let's open up sleep a little bit. Yeah, we, I, if I'm working with anybody one-on-one or my team is really working on the next level. So basically we have three levels in our practice. Uh, we have weight loss, we have wellness, we have anti-aging and the weight loss we're definitely doing with the wellness part. However, if someone's 50 to hundred plus pounds overweight and you help them lose the weight, the dramatic decrease in endogenous estrogen production and inflammation goes down so dramatically that a lot of these dis-ease states start to go away and they become right. well again because a lot of what they have to do in order to lose the weight the healthy way actually gets them healthy again. So we, we take people through this process of um, if they need to lose the weight, lose the weight, get well, overcome autoimmune issues, etc. And then the last part's the anti-aging, and we're really talking about anti-aging, biohacking, optimizing your body, because that's what we're looking to do. I mean, anti-aging starts now, your 30s, 40s, et cetera. It doesn't start when you're 70. Um, you right. can certainly do it when you're 70, yeah. uh, but, but better to start now, because you're going to get that benefit. And we see that in all sorts of animal-based studies as well, that the sooner you start with the time-restricted eating, et cetera, the better the, the long-lived uh, results of that, that individual or that animal. So... What we're looking at is uh, Aura Ring. Uh, that's my preferred one right now. Mm -hmm. uh, there yeah, will be too. better ones in the future. Yeah. I mean, I've got an Apple Watch on right now. I've got an Aura Ring on right mm -hmm. now. I've used all sorts of devices. Uh, the Apple Watch is, I, I did a whole, on my podcast, I did a big breakdown between the Apple Watch and the Aura Ring. So I'm not going to go into that today. I'm sure you've done it as well. Yeah. The Apple Watch is a great motivational tool. Right. That's the bottom line. Yeah. I watch my, I'm like, oh, I need to stand. Because I need to hit my 12 hours minimum per right. day. Yes. Or, oh, no, I, I need to get my 30 minutes of exercise. Or I need to get my 400 calories, which is what I did for extra activity. So it's a motivational tool. It's not a great sleep uh, device. Mm -hmm. It's HRV is hit or miss. I mean, it, it took me about a week, and then it got to, like, like normal HRV, which was good. Yeah. Um, and I'll just let people know, like, I don't have the best HRV in the world. I had, you know, I'm not going to use Addison's disease as an excuse. I don't think some people are born with 100 or 120 no. for an HRV. I think I'm more of what's called the ectomorph of the Vata body type, more sympathetic nervous system, dominant stress, always have been. Uh, but my HRV is great now. I mean, it's yeah. more than doubled it's, since when we started working together, which is great. Awesome. I feel great. I work out five days a week. Um, I work hard at my job. So it is what it, you know, it kind of is what it is. But my sleep is what allows me to do those things. And um, that's what's most important. So what I do is I track my sleep with an aura ring. I still think it is the best right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at not just HRV. That's very important to me overall. Um, and I'll give you a little trick that I use as well for right now. Um, but I'm looking at my respiratory rate, again, body temperature, I keep saying these things, mm -hmm. uh, but also deep sleep and REM. If I got enough deep and I got enough REM and the other numbers were a little off, I'm okay. And then I go right. by how I feel. How do sure. you feel today? Yep. Okay. You feeling all right? Then good. We can do it because I don't. I'm not in a disease state. I'm not in a sickness-based state. If I was, yeah. I'd have to take it easy. I would go by the biometrics. Um, but what I do is, when I'm using a continuous uh, HRV device, then I'm paying much more attention because I can I can regulate it to a higher level anytime that I want, which I love. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I'll go back to that kind of recovery after exercise. But if I'm just doing overnight, what I do, and I've taught this to a bunch of other people, is I don't look at it first thing in the morning. Because I'm not going to let that influence my psychology, good or bad. I'm going to listen to my body. I'm going to have my breakfast. I'm going to start into my day. And then I'm going to look at it around lunch, early afternoon. Now, again, not everybody will do this. This is just for me because I don't want to psych myself out 
that I'm not feeling good that day. Yeah, you could just live a self fulfilling prophecy that way, and, and I love that. And I and I and I think that you know, again, if listeners take nothing from this podcast other than what you just said, it is huge that you cannot place all of your, you can't hedge your bets on objective data alone. Like you really need to check in subjectively because the last thing I want you to do is like you wake up, you feel, you're like, man, dude, I feel like a billion bucks right now. I could go hit this workout. Like I'm feeling like uh, the bomb. You check your aura score and it, you know, you get a 60 or something. You're like, what the heck? Like, no, you're right. Aura. I feel awful. I got terrible sleep. I should skip that workout. Like, you know, I'll just throw everything else out the window. So I, I love that. I think that's a very valuable piece. And it's for one, it's for one day, right. you know, cause then I'll be back up the next day. And so if someone sees this trend over weeks or months and they have low hormone scores and lower, lower neurotransmitters, it's a bit of a different story because we're actually working then on a dis-ease of the body, right? Sure. Yeah. But for me, hormones are good, neuros are good, gut's good. So I, I'm not going to allow a biometric-based device uh, to then dictate what I'm going to feel that day. And mm -hmm. then I'm going to then get into my day, do what I need to do, but I do look at trends. So if yeah, all of a sudden yeah. I'm down, like I, I mean, I'm, I got COVID a little while back mm -hmm. and my HRVs were not good. They're about 50% of what they typically are. Yeah, yeah. That's very important. I looked at that and I said, you get as much rest as you can. You're not going to overexert. You have your entire life to work out, do hard workouts. This is not the time to do it. And so what I did was I really looked at what are things that can shift me into the parasympathetic nervous system where healing takes place. So it's kind of like going back to that CrossFitter. Should you do biofeedback after your workout? Well, maybe, maybe not. But what you do want to do is shift from the sympathetic nervous system to the parasympathetic nervous system, whether it's through breath work, mm -hmm. stretching, um, maybe some sauna, some light sauna, et cetera. Right. When I say light sauna, I mean don't set it at 220, you know, because a lot of <laughs> yeah. people are trying to set their Sweeter sauna as high saunas, as they can to, yeah. just <laughs> to just fight it. And I love that too. Like I do – I mean, I set mine at 200 degrees. It's not 200 when I'm in there. It's probably like maybe 175, 180. Sure, but sure. It's not a contest of me trying to destroy my body. You know, right, all of this right. is meant to build up my body. Indeed. And um, and that's you know, and that's what I do. And so these are all great things, and 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 they're all very helpful. But look for trends rather than daily data. Yeah, no, it's it's a great point. Trends are so important. That's why Aura, that's why Whoop, that's why uh, you know so many other wearables will include that as a part of of their of their information that that you can see as a consumer. Is because yeah, like you you just get small snapshots, and we can't just take snapshots as kind of like something that's generalizable. I mean, it's 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 just that's not the way the body works. We can't say okay, therefore because you know I got you know a sixty on my Aura for my readiness score, that therefore my the rest of my day is going to be a sixty. And I know that's, you know, that's, that's just kind of the way I look at it. You know, I don't see it that way. I, if I see that score, which I do, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, I, I normally check it in the morning or so. Uh, but, you know, I'm, uh, you know it, I think it's each his own, right? But I, I check mine. And for me, like, I have to say, okay, so what, let me check in and then also get a little bit nuanced with the data. Because sometimes, like, I'll see that my sleep architecture looks great. Um, but I'm deducted some points because um, maybe, number one, it, you know, didn't detect, it detected me kind of like uh, not falling asleep early um, because I was either resting um, and I I wasn't sleeping, like I was reading a book, let's say. Uh, there's kind of all these little nuances. But for me, again, like I have to kind of unpack that data. And then again, I don't want to live that self-fulfilling prophecy. And I do the same exact thing with HRV. If I take my morning readiness score on my HRV and I see that, let's say, I'll just use easy math. This is not necessarily mine, for example. But let's say, you know, I, I'm, my baseline's a 100 and I wake up and I see that I'm a 70, which is, again, 30%, obviously, lower than my baseline. For me, like, if I'm subjectively, like, feeling that, and again, I always check in subjectively first, objectively second. If I'm feeling that, then okay, that's a red flag. Like, let's just, let's, let's watch out. Let's be cautious. But I don't say that, oh, no, that's it. Like, I get to sit on my butt and, you know, eat potato chips and, you know, drink soda all day. I wouldn't do that anyway. Way, but you know, I can't. I don't give myself that excuse. Now, it's a level of again, just coming back to marrying subjective feel with objective data. Those are equally as important. And so, again, I'm a huge biometric guy. Like, obviously, I love heart rate variability. I love sleep architecture. I love you know continuous glucose monitors. I, I love biometric data, but it cannot be the end all be all to then determine behavior. Because if that's the case, then there's going to be days where we really miss out on on kind of enjoyment, and we really miss out on training. We really miss out 
on a lot of things because we're trying to just live by our objective data. So I think that's, I think that's clear. Well, I think we're about to wrap some things up today, Stephen, but I wanted to kind of just see real quick as we, if we could get down to brass tacks. And the brass tax would be, like, if you were somebody who's listening to this podcast who says, I have, you know, a significant load of stress, a significantly significant load of anxiety, like things are just kind of like really shaky cognitively for me, like what for you, like, um, would be kind of like, hey, here are the steps that I would take, like, here's the things that I would look at, like, here's how I would get started today. What, what would that be for you? So in an ideal world, like, let's just say we're living in an ideal world and, and people can get right to the root cause. So like you just said, a lot of people will try a certain supplement and they'll try a certain diet plan, whatever it is. But remember, a diet plan is one part of what I call the de-stress protocol. And so there's only, meaning like if you go 100% all in on diet and your diet's fantastic, you're still missing the exercise, stress reduction, toxin removal, rest, emotional balance, supplements, and success mindset, right? So you can be all in and still not get well or reach your goals on right. diet alone because we're looking at health as a multifactorial based approach. So the problem is you can't go 100 you can't go all in in all eight of those areas. So what you need to do is find the areas that you need the most work in. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's what we do. Like again, if you do have deep psychological trauma, then you're going to go more towards emotional based balance because you have to because everything you're doing at that point is a bandage based approach, which is good. You actually need to put a bandage over an open wound, right? But you need to be working on that wound as well. So there's still multiple parts of that, but that's the thing that you go all in on for, for a period of time, along with probably good nutritional supplements just to help make up that and of course right. diet plan. And, but maybe it's just walking. Maybe you don't focus on an hour in the gym. You just get your 10,000 steps. So what I recommend is this, is that people run something like the big five, which is gut function, minerals, vitamins, omega-6s to omega-3s. I mean, omega-6s alone affect your brain, right? Higher levels of inflammatory oxidized fats affect the nervous system and the brain. So we're going to look at all of those. We're going to look at heavy metals. We're going to look at gut function. After that, you're going to get a personalized wellness plan that's based on you. Here are the vitamins that you need. Here are the minerals you need. Okay, we need to remove these certain heavy metals. We need to improve liver detoxification. Here are the hormones that are a little bit low or a little bit high. No bioidenticals. We're just going to work on the root causes like low testosterone. Okay, ashwagandha, vitamin C, zinc, a couple of the things that we know that boost that while reducing stress and improving sleep. Okay, now we're going to look at sleep. What time are you going to bed? Midnight? Okay, why are you going to bed at midnight? Um, and then we just ask, well, if you don't get out of work till 8 o'clock, I get it. I understand. So what we need to do is we need to say, okay, how can we still maximize sleep if you're not getting out of work until 8 o'clock at night? Because we can't change someone's work schedule. So we work with their schedule in order to still make sure that they're getting optimal sleep. And then maybe one day they can start to work that bedtime back by 15 minutes a week until we get closer to that 10 p.m. based hour. So again, you're working with the individual. And then after that, we are then starting to say, okay, you're starting to feel results. You're on the program. Let's now add in that next level, which is a lot of these biometrics. Because what we've realized is that you can't overwhelm someone in the beginning. Yeah. When you give them too many things to do, it's just not going to happen. So we focus on essentially good food, nutri good nutritional supplements to bring up your deficiencies, remove your toxicities, and sleep. Now mm -hmm. walk 10,000 steps per day. Then after that, okay, we're going to focus on exercise biofeedback, maybe even neurofeedback with someone like yourself, mm -hmm. and then biometrics. And the biometrics are more important because now they're exercising. They're doing sauna. Yeah. They're doing whatever it is that they might be doing, uh, or neurofeedback and biofeedback. Remember, those change your biometrics as well. It's not just always right. putting out more energy. It's actually bringing in energy. Exactly. So that is how we do it. And then after that, it's, hey, they're, they're on their own. They're enjoying this new lifestyle. Check in when you want to. Run your labs every quarter, every six months, or every year. Um, but also some people want to then take the journey and they want to say, how far can I take this health? I've got my drive back, my ambition, my libido, my energy. How far can I take this? And that's kind of the road that I've, I've been on for the last 15 years. Yeah. I'm getting older every year, right? Chronologically, but I <laughs> right. feel better biologically every single year, which should not happen. And again, 
a lot of my colleagues say the same thing. So there has to be something to this. I love it, man. You might be getting older in your chronological chronological age, but the health span is widening. And that is just, it's a breath of fresh air, man. I, I appreciate kind of, again, you coming on talking about your holistic integrative approach. I mean, again, like, I think this is just so needed, especially if people are coming from kind of like a pure allopathic background, they're probably hearing this and they're like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize like this was a thing. This is, an, you know, eye opening new world out there. So tell people, how can they find you? Um, like if they wanted to work kind of with like you and your organization how could they do that and then um, also to plug your podcast man because it's amazing appreciate that so the um, company that I founded which is essentially I took my two Boston based practices and I brought them online so it's a functional uh, medicine integrative health based practice and uh, everything that we do in practice we now do virtually all around the world that is called Equalife E-Q-U-I dot L-I-F-E is the website and then the main website is um, just stephencabral.com and it's Stephen with a PH you'll be able to find everything from there so we offer if people can't afford lab testing we offer assessments on my website uh, my podcast is called The Cabral Concept it's a daily podcast teaching you the nuances of all these individual things whether it's hormones thyroid um, digestion etc so yeah that's every day that's called the cabral concept awesome yeah it's a great podcast i've been on there i know patrick our other co-host has been on there as well so i mean it's good stuff um and then uh you know it's a lot of just practical information which is great because you know sometimes this information though we're talking about you know physiology and psychology can be a little bit esoteric for people i love that you're kind of a brass tacks guy you're like hey listen this is what we do this is the practical boots on the ground things that we can do to kind of help you, um, you know, live a better life and optimize your health and well-being. So, yeah, man. Also, too, we'll plug, um, you know, all of Dr. Cabral's uh, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, whatever you guys have. Like, we'll make sure we get on that. So make sure you go follow him. Dude, it has been an absolute pleasure. You brought such a wealth of knowledge, man. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. This was great. And uh, all the best of success on the podcast. Both you and Patrick are amazing individuals. So I appreciate learning from you. And, uh, can't wait to listen to additional episodes. No, absolutely. No, I really appreciate that. Well, again, uh, guys, uh, make sure that you visit the uh, website, hanuhealth.com slash podcast for all today's show notes. Uh, we'll be back at it uh, next week, next Friday. So again, everybody take care. Have a great one. We'll see you soon. Thanks for listening to the Hanu Health Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. This podcast would not happen without listeners and supporters like you. And the best way to support us and the show is to head on over to iTunes and provide us with a five-star review. This helps us reach others and spread the good word of breathing and stress resiliency. If we read your five-star review on air, please reach out to podcast at hanuhealth.com with your name and mailing address, and we will send you some sweet Hanu gear. Until next time, breathe better and stress less.